Because it's time for our final proposition. And that proposition is on, on our bizarre in inability to take into account the interests of our future generations. Global warming goes on despite all available knowledge. We do irreparable damage to our environment. So let's just face the facts and conclude we will never care about future generations. Susan, is that a question you could deal with? Um, I think the question is an argument for having children, actually. Um, I once got into a correspondence with um, a philosopher who thought my views, and this was actually my first, well, one of my first books, um, I didn't think I was being all that hopeful, but he thought I was way too hopeful and he was much more pessimistic about the future of the world and, and he thought I was a kind of naive, left-leaning whatever. And I said, finally, at some point in this correspondence, I said, look, I have three children. I have to get up in the morning. Um, I have to give them some hope that um, you know, what they do in the world is going to make a difference, that they can make some small contribution to its getting better. And um, that's just how I have to live. And he wrote back and he said, I have no children to hope or fear for. And I thought, actually, this is, this is almost a providential argument, or teleological argument, for having children. It gives you a stake in the world. But and I suspect that the people who say that really don't know what it means. Because Susan, that argument would imply that everybody who has children would care about the environment, would care about global warming. Well, unfortunately, that is not the case. Okay. Um, it's certainly not the case uh, because we're dazzled by things that, I mean, so then you care about your children and you worry about their, you know, fitting into the consumer society and, and taking certain steps um, to protect their interest most narrowly defined. But there we go back to the question of the media. What is it that we're being sold? What is it that we're being told to attend to? Um, I actually think it's five minutes to midnight, but I think that this proposition has really been refuted by a wave of finally um, people all over the globe saying, wait a sec. Mm -hmm. Okay, Marcus. Well, I think that, you know, like I'm also neither an optimist nor a pessimist, whatever, but th so the question is... Um, do you have children? Uh, I do, yeah. Um, so the question is just one, but uh, so uh, a child. <laughs> um, so the question is... Uh, um, uh, I mean, yeah, that also changed my views, whatever, but I think there's, uh, I, I, I think it's perfectly fine. Some people have children, other people don't have children, so. Um, however, what I find interesting about this question is, like, why do we seem to be so stupid, okay? And I think the reason for this is that the actual so-called end of the world is precisely not apocalyptic. We have a wrong... Uh, uh, mediated through the unfortunate history that humans have been religious for a long time and still are most of us, uh, due to this unfortunate uh, fact, people believe that, uh, you know, the apocalyptic moment will be very loud, okay? And uh, that's why we do not perceive what's really going on, because it's slow. It's not going to be like in, uh, uh, in an end-of-the-world movie where suddenly a big wave is hitting New York City, Okay, like a 500 meter wave. This is not how it's going to work. Also, global warming doesn't mean that finally we get nicer summers in middle Euro in, uh, in Europe. Okay, so I've heard from friends who say it's finally not a joke to yeah, crack in yeah, this country. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so the point is that uh, 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 we we are not able to perceive long term and very slow movement. That's just a feature of the way we are wired as perceivers. Okay. I, I wouldn't yeah. blame religion yeah. for that, by the way. It's only certain forms of Christianity that have that kind of a apocalyptic view of the end of the world. Um, it's, it's not a, a general function of religion. Yeah. I think you're right that we're, yeah. we're not used to perceiving it's, you know, the frog being slowly uh, boiled to death who yeah. doesn't notice it yeah. um, if, if he's already in the water. But I don't want to blame religion. I think that's a dangerous way to go. Thomas. Uh, when we were debating this uh, before, 
We, we came to the point that it's an interesting example of a fictional entity. I mean, future children are a perfect example of fictional entity, which we use in argumentation. Now, this argument has not been used forever. You will not find this argument in, in, in the old writings of the old philosophers that we do something because of our future generation. This simply was not uh, an, uh, an argument at all. It, we think, started around the time of enlightenment when the whole idea of progress changed in the human mind because all the way up till then, and, and of course you, you're the expert on this, all the way till then, progress was considered to be deteriorating in time. You know, there was the Garden of Eden, it was the illo tempore, the, the perfect harmony with gods, and every generation gets dirty and dirty and further and further away from, from the, the golden age. So, uh, so, so there, of course, one has to immediately have a, uh, a, 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 a suspicion because one is working here with a fictional entity. But on the other hand, money is also a fictional entity, and we have so many fictional entities. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's an interesting uh, thing to, 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 to consider. Now, I would answer your question in a little bit of a different way. You know, when Nietzsche spoke about progress, he spoke about Ubermensch. Ubermensch is something that is born of mankind, but it is higher. It is living outside of good and evil. It is living outside of rationality. In a way, it is no longer working. It has an army of slaves that work for it, and it just sort of dances through in life. Uh, when Nietzsche talked about Ubermensch, I think he was describing a real entity, but he himself wasn't aware that he's actually doing it because he came, as all good people, slightly before his time. The age of Ubermensch has already arrived, and these are our children. As an example, they have an army of slaves, us, the adults, <laughs> that for reason that nobody really fathoms why do we do it, it's economically completely <laughs> nonsensual, you know. I'm investing hundreds of thousands of euros. And all I get is a painting for Christmas. <laughs> Marcus. Well, I think we do have a problem of um, the misrepresentation of our status on Earth. There are a bunch of flight fantasies haunting humanity, and they are part of the justification for why we do not care for Earth. One of those stories is religion. There's an afterlife, there's a God, there's something outside of the world, there's the deluge, which you can find in all religions, the fantasy of the deluge, the big wave hitting. So the idea that there's something outside of either our planet or even outside of the universe, which either will destroy us or help us or whatever, is a huge part of the Susan, misrepresentation of the problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I take strong exception to, um, to a certain kind of anti-religious line blaming religion for all our ills. In fact, my book, Moral mm. Clarity, was partly written to show um, that there are real problems with that view. Um, just one example, I know people in uh, the southern U.S., in Tennessee, where the only point at which, um, let's say, the right and the left can agree is that evangelical Christians have the view that we are stewards of creation and that God gave us this gift that we need to take care of. So you find these different views, and that's a strong view in lots of religions. Um, I think it ought to be, I think we ought to, uh, instead of dumping on religion, I think we ought to be making common cause with those religious views that we can support. Religion doesn't necessarily have to contain the idea of deity, as Tillich well uh, established. So, you, you, I mean, we are all religious. Just somebody believes in, in, in science or, 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 or somebody believes in communism, somebody believes in, you know, God forbid, nazism. And what but Marcus said is no, we've got no. this cultural archive. Flight fantasy, which, yeah. Yeah, 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 flight yeah. fantasy. And yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. religion yeah. is just one of many flight and fantasies. And you will find the same fantasy in today's, you know, computer discourse. Yes. There's the same wave as there. Or Buddhism. Or Buddhism, yeah. So everyday life is bad, you've got to meditate. Whatever the form it takes, it's a flight fantasy. I think it's a, uh, as far as we know humanity as it has been forged by many coincidences, incidences over the last 20,000 years as a cultural entity, it's haunted by a flight fantasy. And the origin of the flight fantasy is just ignorance. People who started creating human beliefs about this planet, okay, based their belief on sheer ignorance, and in particular, they had no clue where they were. We started roughly figuring out that we are on a planet and that we will, by the way, never colonize other planets. We will never move with light speed outside of Star Trek. None of this is ever going to happen. That's the one chance, and also that planet is going to go down. And that is something we can only know, thanks to scientific discoveries, for less than 50 years. 
So we are in a completely new yeah. position, and our reactions, symbolic reactions to this, religion being one of them, this entire setup doesn't do us any good anymore because now we have different kinds of facts to face. I think that's a revolution that we now have. Let's hope we get rid of that flight fantasy soon enough. <laughs> Thank you for now for your brain power. Um